again, we are not going to pick up on, uh, this is module nine, actually. Uh, I know, kind of crazy. Um, doesn't seem like we're probably going to get through all the modules, but that's okay. We'll make it work. Um, very likely that we're going to end up um, at least getting to the Cold War, though, getting through that. Anyway, so uh, we're going to look at sort of kind of what's going on with the psyche and the mindset of, uh, of people and dealing with the consequences of World War I from both an emotional and psychological uh, standpoint. Also, in terms of finances, um, we're going to talk about how we end up with fascism being a form of government that people in Europe and especially Italy and Germany are going to adapt to and, and um it's kind of weird because from our perspective, fascism basically sounds like a terrible idea. But um, here is kind of some uh, political satire here. It says the spineless leaders of democracy, and then you have Adolf Hitler like doing his little playing the trumpet dance behind him, you know, like nanny nanny boo boo, we're going to win, um, which is like first ground playground stuff, first grade playground stuff. Um, and so he's kind of walking on their backs up into the higher ranks, if you can kind of see that. Um, but it's kind of interesting how Hitler ends up doing what he did, and it mostly is because everybody in the world just kind of let him do it. Um, now, when we talk about the major causes of World War II, there are a ton of them. Uh, some are more drastic than others, but you do need to understand that we don't just have one cause or two causes or three causes for World War II. You really have a ton of them. And, you know, you have the rise of Hitler, the Treaty of Versailles, rise of fascism, Japanese expansionism, economic depression, anti-communism, appeasement, militarism. All of these things are really going to be things that really play together to kind of set up this situation that World War II can take place in. Um, the first one that we're going to look at here is the Treaty of Versailles. And unfortunately, after World War I, the Treaty of Versailles is basically a disaster. That's the treaty that everybody got together and said, hey, we're going to end World War I, Treaty of Versailles. Let's blame Germany, right? Um, and Germany is basically a forced to accept all blame for the war. They have to pay millions of dollars of reparations to Britain and France. Uh, they also have to you know, have armament restri restrictions where they can't have an army. Um, you know, and so you end up with about 32 nations that are represented in this treaty, which is about, at the time, like 75% of the world. So it's a pretty strong sampling of the globe that, that comes in and says, no, it's Germany's fault. Because remember, all the independent countries in Southeast Asia and Africa and all this, they were all under the control of basically Europe. So 32 nations was about 75%. That means there was only like 50 countries in the world, if that. Think about that. Today, there's like 200 and something. Okay, so ultimately, Germany's forced to deal with the very severe punishments, except all the, the blame. Uh, the debt that is laid on them is so high. It, the, the amount of money that they had to pay back for World War I was so much that they actually did not make the final installment payment from World War I, which ended in 1918, until October 3rd of 2010. It took them almost a hundred years to pay off the debt that got imposed on them after World War I. And so, um, you know, it was somewhere between 90 and 100 million dollars that they had to pay back. Um, so, again, it held Germany for responsible are being responsible, um, but we know that World War I was not just the cause of Germany. Uh, it was a combination of a lot of factors, not just one factor, but you have imperialism and nationalism and alliances, which uh, allows this spark of the Ferdinand assassination, if you remember the Ferdinand assassination kind of being the spark that lit the flame. But basically, Germany's going to take the brunt of it anyway. Uh, the treaty made Germany essentially non-existent uh, militarily. Um, you know, they, they had to lower their army down to 100,000 men, which in that day was just not large enough at all. 
Uh, today, I don't. I mean, I don't know how many people are in the armed forces today for the United States, but um, yeah, look that up. It's probably in the tens of thousands that are active military. Um, I'd, I'd be shocked if it's over 50. Maybe it is, but how many? Okay, so 480,000. But that's spread across the globe, right? Yes, yeah, so basically 480,000, half a million people in the United States Army. Does that include active or is that include reserves as well. Okay. So we have a pretty decent sized army. Uh, back then, you're talking about armies that were like four or five million. So when you tell Germany that you can only have 100,000 and Britain is still going to have millions and France is still going to have millions and all these people are going to still have millions of people in their army, 100,000 is not going to get you very far. Um, they weren't allowed to have any tanks at all, uh, which... It's kind of crazy because they became very famous for being good at using tanks. So they were like, no tanks. They were allowed to have no aircraft in their air force at all. Um, the total weight of the ships had to be under 100,000 tons. Um, but to put that in context, uh, the USS Iowa, by the time you get to um, World War II, the USS Iowa weighed 45,000 tons It's just by itself. And so they said the entire German Navy could only weigh 100,000 tons. So you have like two ships. Yeah, good luck with having a Navy when you got two boats. You got some dudes out there rowing. <laughs> yeah, this is a very good deployment. We are going to row all the way across the river. What are we going to do in the Gitza? We are going to have a good time. <laughs> we can't go to war. We don't have any people. There you go. Um, the Japanese actually had a boat, uh, the Yamamoto, uh, during World War II, that actually was like 65,000 tons. So that's a big boat. That's an aircraft carrier. Right? And so um, it's so designed to keep Germany uh, and punish them that um, the German pre people actually signed it, you know, under protest. But the U.S. Congress actually refused to ratify it. They were like, this is not going to be a good treaty for preventing war. This is not the right way to handle World War I, to be completely honest. Um, also, President Wilson has his own plan that doesn't end up happening, but the 14 points plan, and we talked a little bit about that maybe. I can't remember if it was in here or not. Yeah, we did. Uh, and so... Essentially, Germany is left in pretty bad shape. Now, you add to that the rise of fascism in Italy. Uh, fascism is a totalitarian form of government in which the government is glorified by the state. There's only one party leader, and all aspects of society are controlled by the government. No opposition or protests are tolerated, and propaganda and censorship are widely practiced. Uh, and this comes from the mind of a guy named Benito Mussolini. He was a very famous Italian leader during World War II. Now, the backstory here is that in March of 1919, Mussolini uh, forms what he calls the fascist party. And he really galvanizes support for this fascist party from the unemployed war veterans. World War I ends, all these war veterans... Um, are looking around going like, okay, now what? We started out on one side of World War I, we switched to the other. It seems like we're kind of getting screwed in this whole treaty process, and also we're bankrupt. So what are we supposed to do? We have all these skills, we learn how to fight, we can't get jobs. Mussolini comes in and he says, hey, I'll give you a job, don't worry. Why don't you help me overthrow the government? And they were like, well, it's better than sitting at home. My wife won't stop talking to me. And I guess I'd rather go overthrow the government than have to put up with this anymore. So let's go be fascists. Um, and he organizes them into these squads known as black shirts. Now, here's the funny thing. You ready? 
Benito Mussolini organizes the war veterans into a groups that are going to terrorize his political opponents. His political opponents then say, this is crazy, we're being terrorized. Who are these people? Because they don't reveal who's kind of organizing necessarily. And there's all this political chaos, right? And so by 1921, they're like, Mussolini is like, hey, I can make them stop. And they're like, fine, if you can make them stop, come be a part of our government, and you can tell us how to make them stop. Now, he is the one that organized them. And then, on October 22nd of 1921, Italy is slipping in, so the black shirts are going to march on Rome. And so the black shirts get together and they go, we're going to overthrow the government, we're going to march on Rome. And Mussolini is like, hey, everybody, I can make them stop. And everybody's like, do you think you can really make them stop? He's like, just give me control of the government and I'll make them stop. Remember, he organized them. And then they basically say, fine, Mussolini, you, you, you make them stop. And then he's like, hey, guys, just stop. And they were like, okay. And, but now Mussolini is dictator of the country. It's pretty smart. It's one way to do it. Oh, yeah, they fell for it. Like straight up, like you create the crisis and then you create the solution to the crisis and you're the hero that stopped the crisis. Um, and they, you know, there's a, he, now he's going to be this strong leader, new, creates a new national identity. Uh, he's very charismatic. Um, and, you know, it, it kind of catches on. People like Hitler look at Mussolini and he's like, now that is the way to do it which is not good because Hitler's a butthole. Um, Mussolini coins the term fascism in 1919 to describe this thing. Um, and so, again, um, he becomes dictator because he basically, they, the king says, you take it and solve this problem, and he does. And then in 1925, he makes himself dictator, taking the uh, title of El Duce, which is like, uh, like, I don't remember what it is in Italian. He's a butthole. Um, and so he rules and takes power. By 1935, he's going to invade um, Abyssinia, which is Ethiopia. And this is really one of the first steps towards World War II uh, because, you know, he's attacking people's territory. Um, Hitler's going to borrow a lot of those ideas and expand upon them. Uh, and so understand that there is a major connection between uh, the rise of fascism and the, and the uh, rise of World War II. Um, and so, you know, it, it's pretty crazy. Um, let me see here. Yeah, World War II is going to be really bad. Germany, we can trace a clear connection between the rise in unemployment and the hard times, leading to an increase uh, of rise in votes for Hitler and the Nazi Party. Now understand, uh, Adolf Hitler was not even German. Uh, he, he was not even born in Germany. He was actually born in Austria. Uh, his name was also not Adolf Hitler. Uh, and so he actually took that name uh, up until the time he was about 38. Uh, his, he, his name was Adolf Schickelgruber. Um, right? It really was. Um, he was the supposed bastard child of his mother, uh, who was a Schickelgruber, and his father, who, uh, his name was Adolf uh, Heitler. But um, by the, his dad den denounced him and denounced him and denounced him and said, you're not my son. Uh, you know, your, your mom was a whore or whatever, whatever people used to say back in the day to not claim their children, or even today. Um, and so basically, but uh, Adolf begins to have a little bit of political clout. And by the time he gets to where he's going to be taking over, his dad shows back up and he's like, oh, my son, you can have my name now. And he becomes Adolf Hitler. But Adolf Schickelgruber probably isn't able to take over the world. I'm going to be honest with you. Um, it just doesn't have the same ring to it, you know. Yeah, Schickelgruber. Yeah, it's not quite the same. Um, so just understand, though, that uh, he served in the Army. 
uh, Austria would not actually let them in his, their army because he was not strong enough. He was too weak. Um, he did attend uh, art school, or he attempted to attend art school, and they told him, bro, you suck. You can't go to art school here. Um, there was some evidence that his hatred from Jews may have come from um, the fact that when he was in art school, there was a girl that he really liked, and um, he went to her and tried to ask her out on a date, and she was like, bro, you suck, and you're a loser, and she was Jewish, and then from that point on, he was like, Zan those Jews! They have denied me happiness for the last time. Yeah, so, um, so basically, his Nazi party actually uh, starts, and this is, you can't see it here, but basically, um, in 1929, he actually launches this na Nazi party. Uh, it kind of goes along with the Great Depression, but at the time, uh, or it's actually 1928, at the time, nobody in Germany, because everything was going good. Remember, the Roaring Twenties in America made the whole world economy get better, and uh, the, not, the German people are doing okay. Life's not great, but it's okay. So 1928, before the Great Depression hits, he launches his party, and they try and get support, and they only get like 2.6% of the vote. Like 2.6% of Germans vote for the Adolf Hitler uh, Socialist Party. The, the Nazi party. And, uh, but then after the depression hits and life gets really, really rough and things get worse and Germany's in this huge depression, uh, by 1930, they get 18% of the vote. And then by 1932, they're getting 37% of the vote. Um, then by 1933, they get 43% of the vote. And um, it's at this point where basically um, he's able to take over the government and become chancellor. Now, you can also look at uh, the number of votes that people got for Hitler in the Weimar Republic, which was their Democrat government between the wars. You know, and uh, the unemployment rate is like 0.3% in uh, 1924. They get, you know, 1.9 million votes. 1.1% unemployment, 6.4 million votes. 5.3% unemployment, oh, 11.7 million votes. Because he's saying, hey, I'm going to bring Germany back. I'm going to give everybody jobs. We're going to build up our country. We're going to build tanks. We're going to build all these things and make everybody rich and happy again. And everybody's like, anything's better than what we're doing now. And so he really does, uh, that does help him. And again, the Roaring Twenties ended, World War I, you know, they were unstable, then you had the Great Depression, and undoubtedly, you can see here that it's going to cause major problems. Um, and so desperate people are going to seek help from those powerful leaders who are going to promise wealth uh, via military might. And so you have to understand, that's kind of how you end up with people like Hitler, who are just, they're insane, truly insane. Um, that's how you end up with them in power. Now, uh, continuing through on section two, we're just going to do the first two sections in this first uh, lecture video here. Um, we're going to look at the buildup and, and take a look at Japan and some of the other images, or in some of the other uh, aspects of um, how this works. And if you remember the pinwheel, if we go all the way back to here, we talked about Rise of Hitler, Treaty of Versailles, Rise in Fascism. Now we're going to talk about Japanese expansionism, okay? So if we're looking here, um, Japanese are really going to be motivated by two things. One, Japan is an island that is a volcanic island, right? Like, it it's, does not have a ton of natural resources. There's no oil there. Uh, it's not a huge landmass. There's not... Tons of fresh water, uh, but really it's oil and rubber and all these things. If you want to be an industrialized nation, you've got to have access to these things, okay? Steel, iron, you know what I mean? Like iron and, and coal, and they don't have it. And so they really are going to have to expand to become a major global power 
in order to get access to these things. Now, the closest place that they can actually get access to these things is China. All right? They're going to go to China. And so they are actually, in 1931, they invade Manchuria, which is a portion of China. And they are looking for raw materials. And in that same year, they're going to start attacking China with a full-scale attack. And so um, they're going to go to full-out war. Um, and by 1937, you have something called the Sino-Japanese War. And then in 1938, they begin to attack the Soviet Union. And, um, you know, they start adding all of these things. Um, and the Soviet-Japanese border is going to be a constant conflict. But believe it or not, the Japanese are, like, kicking everybody's butts. Like, and, and I think I mentioned it not long ago that, you know, the Japanese Holocaust, where basically, you know, we hear about the Jewish Holocaust quite a bit. You don't realize that J the Japanese killed just as many uh, Chinese people than the Germans killed Jews. You're talking ten, like 10 million people that they literally put in concentration camps and just starved and murdered to death. Um, and, you know, World War, these first couple conflicts of World War II are really going to continue to spread and blossom. And, and one of the reasons that we end up involved in World War II as the United States anyways is because, uh, remember, we had control or at least influence in the Philippines. You remember when we took Hawaii and then we fought against Cuba and against the Spanish? And when we beat the Spanish in Cuba, then we went to the Philippines and beat them there. And we didn't necessarily totally annex them, make them like a state, but they're our territory, right? Well, there's also a lot of natural resources there. And the Japanese end up being worried that if they're going to continue to expand, that we're going to get mad at them for, you know, expanding into the Philippines. And so they think they're going to have to take us out first, which is, uh, it's a big mistake. Um, now, the next part is, you know, the totalitarian regimes. That just means governments that are in control of all aspects of their lives. There's no liberty, no individuals, no liberalism, uh, but just full-on totalitarian re regimes where people end up actually choosing fascism over communism. Um, and there is a difference there. We think, oh, communists, fascists, they're all, no. Communists are like, oh, the people have everything. Fascism is the government has everything, and you just do what they tell you. Like, there's no options. Communism is, well, we all share. Like, no, not in fascism. So they actually kind of hate each other. Fascists actually kind of hate the communists because fascists say, no, I'm in the government. I'm more important than you. Communists say, nobody is more important than anyone else. So fascism and communism don't actually work all that great together. Um, and so, you know, you have... These people coming together that, uh, you know, Karl Marx and Frederick Eng Engels, um, they're, they're all against capitalism. And so um, they come up with this idea of like, oh, we're going to share wealth and it's all going to be good for everyone. Uh, but, you know, that's not going to work. You know, now Stalin in, in Russia does kind of uh, take up the mantle of communism and be like, we're going to return this country to the people instead of the elites. And then by doing, to do that, you have to like murder all the elites. So you had like the Soviet purge, the Bolshevik purge where they kill like million people. Just like, oh, you know how to read? You got to die. Mm. Oh, you're, you teach in university? Oh, we can't have all these smart people going around. They'll figure out we're, this doesn't work in reality, you got to die. So they just kill everybody that's smart. Um, fascism was deliberately giving power to one person, though, right? And Hitler uses it to a great effect, sets up his totalitarian regi regime. Now, the worst thing here, and this won't take too long, but the probably the worst thing in all of the buildup to World War II is appeasement, because this is insane. Hitler is breaking all of the Treaty of Versailles. He's do, everything he's doing is breaking the Treaty of Versailles. He's basically saying, 
I'm just going to take your treaty and wipe my butt with it. Like, I, oh, I can't have a military? Well, I'm going to. Oh, I can't invade anywhere? Well, I'm going to. Oh, I can't have tanks? Watch this. Tank, 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 tank. I can't have uh, submarines? I shoot your boats with submarines. Uh, what are you going to do about it? And everybody's like, oh, nothing. Right? So here's what happened. He starts making all these demands now that he's in charge. And all of Europe and all the rest of the world is like, well, if we just, you know, he, he seems like a nice enough fella. Uh, maybe we should just like, you know, like give him a little bit of what he wants and then he'll stop asking. Now, my son is five. And a lot of times he comes to me and he's like, Dad, I want some candy. And I'm like, no, son, you can't have candy because we're about to have dinner. He's like, hmm, I want some candy. And I was like, son, you're about to want to not get a whooping, boy. Boy. And so now that is me saying no. Now, if I were to be like, okay, you can't have candy. He was like, but I want candy. And I was like, okay, but you can just have one piece of candy and then no more, which is what my wife does. And then five minutes later, they're like, more candy. And then when you don't give it to them, they're like, ah! And then you have to give them more candy. That's called appeasement because you're basically just giving them what they want so they won't whine and cry. Well, that's kind of what we did with Hitler. Hitler was like, uh, hey, in Germany, we're going to be better than we used to be. But in order to do that, we need to take that country back that they took from us, like Czechoslovakia. And so they go in in 1938, and he just invades. And Britain and France are like, hey, you can't do that. And he's like, uh, but, but I did. <laughs> do you want to go to war about it? And they were like, I mean, well, you don't have to go to war or anything. I mean, I do think it's kind of ridiculous that we took it from you in the first place, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you're right. I mean, that did belong to y'all beforehand, so who were we to take it away? Yeah, don't take anything that didn't belong to you before, though, okay? There, Hitler, right? And so to avoid war, they've basically given Hitler more land back. Now, it's very agriculturally fertile land, and of course this is going to be a slippery slope because it's probably one of the greatest mistakes in human history, just allowing Hitler just to take Czechoslovakia back. Uh, but they, again, think, hey, you know, we'll just go with it. Now, here's the real problem with that. They didn't ask the Czechoslovakians whether they wanted to be a part of Germany. The Czechoslovakians at the end of World War I were like, we want to be our own country. And then Germany came in and they were like, nine. <laughs> you will be a part of our country. And then they're like, no, we don't want to be. And France and Britain said, shut up, Czechoslovakia. We're not trying to go to war. Just shut up. Which is crazy. So basically, uh, it's really irritating because he's like, Everybody's like, we have to play by the rules of the game. And Hitler's like, nine. We are not going to follow the rules. <laughs> you can follow the rules. We are not going to. And so then, the next area that he's going to invade is called the Sudetenland. Uh, that had also been taken away from Germany. Now, a bunch of Germans lived there. Like, the majority of people living there were German. And so he goes in, he's like, hey, you know, these people are kind of German anyways. I think they want to be a part of Germany. And the people are like, yeah, yeah, we want to be a part of Germany. And so, again, he's allowed to just absorb them. And the other countries are just like, yeah, what can we do about it? We don't want to go to war, right? So stupid. We also end up with the glorification of militarism. Uh, it's glorifying the military, strengthening the military, stockpiling weapons, indoctrinating the youth, and training a fighting force that is totally buying in to the idea that your country's the best. Now, Hitler did this really well. Hitler, you know, they had like the Boy Scouts in Germany, right? 
110? Yeah. So they had like what was the Boy Scouts, right? All the little German boys. They are going to learn how to start fires, and they are going to help old ladies across the street. And then Hitler's like, nein, they are going to learn that Germany is the best country in the world. And they are going to love me. So he basically turns the Boy Scouts into what he calls the Hitler Youth Program, which is where he basically brainwashes them from a very young age to, you know, want to join the military and snitch on their friends and parents if they're doing anything wrong and hunt down the Jews. Yeah. And so basically he turns his entire country from the age of six till death into a country that glorifies the military. Yeah. He also wanted to create a master race through this Hitler Youth program. Um, and, you know, you had, like, the famous doctor there. Uh, 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 what's his name? Uh, uh, Mengele or whatever his name is. What a butthole. I wish that guy was still alive so I could kill him. I wouldn't. I mean, that's a, it's a, it's hyperbole. I, I wouldn't kill him, actually. We'd keep him alive. Just like burn him a little bit at a time, huh? Oh, he was just a—he just like did all these experiments on people, like the Jews, and like like he—he he thought that twins had like this weird connection that they could feel each other's pain and stuff. So he would take like like twin babies and he'd like torture them to see if the other one could do it, and he'd like, yeah, it was crazy. Dude was a terrible person. Yeah. He thought that maybe he could connect them by like conjoining them, so he like would sew twins together and stuff. Like, yeah, it's crazy, bro. No, probably not that. Um, so basically, you know, he wanted like it was just nuts. Like this, the Nazis were crazy. Americans weren't helping out though because we wanted to be isolated after World War I. We basically said, hey, we, re we saved y'all's tail, but we're going to go back to doing our own thing. We've got our own problems and we, we want to remain neutral. Y'all clearly are not committed to really staying out of war because you don't bring in the 14 point plan, right? If Wilson's plan had been put in place, there's a chance that World War II would have never happened in the first place. So we're like, hey, if you're not going to listen to us, then you can do your own thing. And we just kind of stay out of it. Now, the problem with that is, is that while we stayed out of it, you know, militarily, everybody relied on our economics. And so when we do end up basically um, having the Great Depression, it crushes the rest of the world. But, um, you know, for the most part, people did not want to be involved in World War II. Uh, they believed that conflict in Europe was their problem and that they should have to figure it out themselves. And it, this made us very weak and isolated. Um, and so they actually had a congressional uh, meeting that concluded we were tricked into joining World War I by arms manufacturers and propaganda, which maybe there's something to that. But then we're definitely not tricked to getting into World War II because Pearl Harbor, and then we gotta, we're going to have to put the hammer down on Japan them two bombs crushed them. Uh, you can see here that the war was kind of fought all over the place. Um, North Africa, Europe, Asia, the Pacific, the Atlantic, all over the place. Um, these are the kind of Hitler's World War II partners, Italy, Slovakia, Hungary, Bulgaria, Romania, Japan, Finland, Croatia. They all caught that dope, that, that, that uh, uh, pretty hard, bruh. Like, that didn't turn out well for them. Most of these countries ended up as part of the USSR, actually. Um, but, you know. And then this is us, the Allied powers, not playing no games. Except, uh, basically, all these other countries were fighting and getting the crap kicked out of them until we showed up. So, they really were. Germany, the biggest mistake ever made in the history of war probably was the attack on Pearl Harbor. Very likely. One of the dumbest strategic moves ever. What do you mean? 
I, I explained that earlier. I just talked about it. Yeah. Yeah, I just, it's so crazy to think that, you know, like, Japan had a sneak attack on Hawaii when they flew all the way from here, and they flew all the way around here and then hit Hawaii so that they wouldn't be seen, you know, because the earth is flat, so they would have had to fly all the way, all the way around all the continents <laughs> in order to get there without being seen. So that's just crazy that they were able to do that. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> yeah, they would have been seen for sure. So, all right, that's the end of section.